While a church that has been around for a while may have many strengths, it has also had time to gather problems. Living Truth takes to the streets to ask people, are churches more centered on themselves or the community around them? I believe there's a variety. Uh, some churches are very, I don't know if you'd say inward looking, but uh, they stick to the traditions of their church and there are some that are maybe uh, more outward looking, reaching out or maybe looking for a new mission to fulfill. Religion is, an, is about the people and to me, it's more about how much money they can bring in and I just, I don't know. It's a big debate in our family and I just try to stay away from religion and politics. As a result of the fact that they're no longer motivated by the fact that they want to make a belief system, they want to make a system where they can control people and make money doing so. And yeah, it's self-serving, but the, what is the service that they're looking for? Uh, if, if, if people's salvation is, is what they're looking to serve, then sure it's self-serving. We tend to generalize and say all churches are just inward looking, but I know there's some churches that do focus on the needs of others. On today's program, Charles Price begins a new series, The Dynamics of an Effective Church. He teaches about the dangers well-established churches can run into, particularly the danger of becoming inward looking. You got your Bible with you? I'm going to read from the book of Revelation in chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to read the first three verses only, or the first two and a half verses, in fact. You may know that in the early chapters, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus Christ himself addresses letters to seven different churches, all in the region of Asia Minor, present-day western Turkey. And I'm going to read you part of what he wrote to the church in a town called Sardis. Revelation 3, verse 1, The angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. That is as far as I'm going to read, and I'm going to not speak about this passage specifically, but we'll come back to this in a little while. Eighty years ago this weekend, the People's Church held its first service. They met down in Massey Hall in downtown Toronto. Oswald J. Smith had had a vision put into his heart some years before of a particular kind of church, and it was born 80 years ago this weekend. He called it initially the Cosmopolitan Tabernacle. That was a remarkably prophetic name. Although the name didn't last for long, they changed the people's church, but look around this congregation this morning. Where, anywhere, is there a more cosmopolitan congregation in a more cosmopolitan city than the People's Church here in Toronto. On our database currently, we have record that there are 74 mother tongues spoken by members of this congregation, plus English. That makes it 75. If I said 75, you'd think I was just plucking around figure outs. But it's exactly 74 plus English. 75 mother tongues spoken in this congregation. Over 100 nationalities gather here week by week, and of course we are representative of this city of Toronto. Now, 80 years ago, the city was not made up in the way that it is today. The population was a little under 600,000, making it the second largest city in Canada. Montreal was a little bit bigger. And in a census, taken around that time, just a couple of years before this church began, 
81% of the citizens of Toronto claimed some form of British heritage. The second largest single cultural group were Jewish people who formed 7% of the population. Italians made up 2% of the population and the rest, according to the census of that time, was primarily Polish, Ukrainian and Chinese, plus a scattering, of course, of others. In that census, the religious profile of this city was described as denominational pluralism. I quote the words that they used. Now, we're familiar with the word pluralism, and when we speak of pluralism today, we tend to talk about a multitude of ethnic, religious, cultural background. Religious pluralism today would mean that we have Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Jews and so on. But actually in Toronto 80 years ago, they're going to find a denominational pluralism, meaning that there were Catholics, there were Anglicans, there were Presbyterians, there were Methodists, there were Baptists, there were Alliance folks, there were Congregations, etc. Although in the mid-1920s, some Methodists and half the uh, Presbyterians and half the Congregationists joined together to form the United Church of Canada, which meant instead of having four denominations, they created five, <laughs> because a lot of people stayed back in the Methodist and Presbyterian and so on. Also, Smith sought to distance the people's church from the denominations of the city. And he wrote, and I quote to you, he said, We are separate from all churches and denominations, reaching out for the thousands of people who never enter a church door. In other words, we exist not primarily for the well-being of the Christian community. We exist in order to reach those who would never darken a church door. And so the removal of any denominational tag was seemed to be a way in which people might feel more at liberty. Using a secular hall, the Massey Hall, was seen to be a neutral uh, place in which to hold those meetings. And they stayed in the Massey Hall only for four months. Uh, and then they had to move on and move out of there. But let me read you what Oswald Smith wrote back in those early days from his autobiography, The Story of My Life. He said, The People's Church is an independent work standing preeminently for the salvation of souls, the edification of believers, and worldwide evangelism, endeavoring by every means to get the message to the Christless masses, both at home and abroad, in the shortest possible time. We believe in an unmutilated Bible, meaning, and particularly in that, his day, in that day, when there was a whole modernist movement that was tearing the scriptures apart, we believe in the entire scripture as being the revelation of God, and therefore authoritative. So we believe in an unmutilated Bible, salvation through the blood of Christ, entire separation from the world, victory over all known sins through the indwelling spirit, rugged consecration to sacrificial service, Practical faith in the sufficiency of Christ for spiritual, temporal, and physical needs, the purifying hope of the Lord's return, and a burning missionary zeal for bringing back the King to world evangelization. I don't think I've ever read a better mission statement for a church than that. That is what this church was to be about was what he wrote and declared in those early days. In the light of the fact that this is our 80th anniversary, I want to begin this morning a series of messages over a number of weeks on the Church of Jesus Christ as it is revealed to us in the New Testament. I'm calling it the dynamics of an effective church. And I want to begin today by talking about the dangers of a mature church. And by mature, I don't, of course, mean spiritually mature. I mean chronologically mature. That is, a church that's been around for a long time. In the early days of a church's history, there is a freshness, there is a vitality, there is vision, there is a commitment to the task which it came into being. And nearly always, every church that's founded is founded for very good reasons and close to the purposes of God. But in the course of time, it is very easy for a church to be exposed to dangers of sliding away from its first primary purpose to secondary things. 
You know, the last book of the New Testament was written around 95 A.D. Christ ascended to his father around 30 A.D., so there's been a 65-year history in the pages of the New Testament, of the church, that is. And yet, throughout the letters of Paul, through some of these letters, these seven letters in the book of Revelation, you find all kinds of things happening, unintentionally, no doubt, by those who are his leaders, but which are incrementally sliding away from the primary purpose for which the church was called into exist. There is the danger, for instance, of moving from being outward-looking to becoming inward-looking. There is the danger of moving from being God-centered to becoming human-centered and need-centered. There is the danger of moving from being a living organism where Christ is head of his church and his spirit is the life of his church to becoming simply a well-managed organization. There's the danger of moving from being spirit-dependent to being self-sufficient. There is the danger of moving our thinking from biblical revelation as the authority and sufficient authority for the church of Jesus Christ to relying on human reasoning and filtering revelation through reasoning so that reason becomes the criteria. We need to be reasonable about Scripture, of course. We use our reason. But we submit our reason to its revelation. And I could point to you in the letters of the New Testament and here in the early part of the book of Revelation to all of those things I've mentioned that would be too tedious if I identified them all and which churches had which problem. But they're all there in the New Testament church. And therefore, we will be unwise to not know that these temptations are here also. And I want to look at one of these things. I was planning to look at several, but in the first service this morning I only got to one, so we'll just say one and stick to one. And the danger that exists of moving from being outward-looking to becoming inward-looking. A local church has no right to define itself. It is the prerogative of Jesus Christ alone to define the church, for it is his church. It's designed to fulfill his purpose. And yet, when you go back to the four Gospels, which reveal to us, of course, the years of Jesus' ministry as a man on earth, it is interesting, if not surprising, that he actually said very little about the church itself, the word church only left his lips twice in the record of the four Gospels, both times in Matthew's Gospel. But although he didn't use the word church very much, when it came to the completion of his work on earth, he left his disciples in absolutely no doubt as to what his intention was for the days ahead. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, all record different marching orders that Jesus gave to the church. And the reason why they record different marching orders, and this is after his resurrection and before his ascension, the reason why they record different marching orders, I suggest you, is because he said it so often, in so many different ways, they simply chose one each in recording the history that they recorded. In Matthew, for instance, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, when he invited his disciples to meet him in Galilee, he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And I imagine if when Jesus said that, he then stopped and said to his disciples, any questions? I think there'll be a silence. No, we understand. We've got it. Very clear. We're to take, make disciples of all nations. Mark records an occasion when Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection, and he said in Mark 16:15, he said to them, "Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every." Creature. Any questions? 
And they probably said, no, we get it. The gospel to every person. Luke records that Jesus appeared to them when they were in a closed room and he startled them and it says that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures and he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. Any questions? Now, I think we've got it. John records, John 20, on the day of his resurrection. He again came and met with his disciples. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. As I have been sent by my Father on a mission, so I am sending you on a mission. Any questions? Now we get it. And in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, on the day of his ascension, when he met with his disciples on the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem, he said to them this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he couldn't say any questions after that because immediately he'd said that, it says, he was lifted up, and a cloud hid them from his sight. He ascended to his father. Two angels appeared and said, What are you doing? Why are you standing around looking up in the sky? Get on with the job. Do you understand what the job is? And they would have said very clearly, Yes, we understand. We are to preach the gospel to the whole world. We are to make disciples of all nations. We are to start where we are here in Jerusalem and expand our circles until we are reaching the ends of the earth and we are to do it by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is why Jesus has said to us, stay here until you endure with power from on high, but it's in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You'll take this message right out to the ends of the earth. You'll begin the process, the next generation will extend it, the next generation, the next generation, and right on through until the ends of the age. Anything confusing about that? The mandate was very clear. Now let me ask the question. Are we equally clear about this? Are we as a church equally clear that this is our primary mandate? May I ask you personally, are you equally clear about this? As to what is really important, as to where our priorities lie, as to where we invest our monies, is this a priority? Do we understand it? Now, there are three responses we can make to a command like this. We can say, firstly, I can't do this. We can say, secondly, I won't do this. We can say, thirdly, I will do this. Let me just comment briefly on that, because every one of us responds in one of those three ways. I can't think of a fourth response. I can't, I won't, or I will. Now, you may, of course, be here this morning and say, well, I've actually not really thought about this, which is reasonable enough. Some people in the business of life don't stop to think about some of these things. Uh, but that, if that is your response, that comes to an end this morning. Because we are going to think about this. Now, the most common response is, I can't. The task is so big, I am so little, there are people who are a lot more able than I am, I don't think I've made much difference anyway, I can't do this. You know, the interesting thing when you read through the scripture is that this is an extremely common response to the commands that God gave to people, Abraham, I'm an old man, my wife is as good as dead, her womb is dead, 
you're talking about us having a son. We can't do this. Moses called the burning bush. Who am I? I can't do this. Joshua, I can't do this. David, I can't do this. Jeremiah, I can't speak. And you've called me a prophet. And we could go through so many, many, many people in the scripture who came to this point of saying, in effect, I can't do this. Peter in the New Testament. We get tongue-tied. We don't know what to say. This used to be my excuse when I was first a Christian. I I was basically shy, introverted. I couldn't do anything in public. At school, we had a debating class. When one student would put an argument for uh, a motion, another one would oppose it, and everybody was supposed to do this. I was exempt because I couldn't stand up publicly and articulate myself in front of people, so I was exempt from taking part in that. I didn't take part in drama. I I couldn't act. I still can't act. Um, But uh, I had every excuse. I can't do this. It is true, of course, we all have different roles and gifts, and we're going to talk about that in a few weeks' time. We're not all evangelists. There is a gift of the evangelist, which is not necessarily a gift of preaching, but there is that gift. There's some people I admire tremendously who have that gift of coming alongside alongside folks and just, just leading them to Christ. And some people seem to have a gift of that. When I was at Cape May, we had a student from Egypt who, who was a gifted evangelist and he, he would lead people to Christ in all kinds of situations where people like me would never even begin to get into a conversation. I remember one day I, I was with him and a team of students. We were doing an outreach actually and we were doing something and we sent him to get some fish and chips for lunch from a local fish and chip shop and he came back, took him a while because the line was long and, and, and when he came back he said, hey, it was a long line but it was great, I led the person in front of me to Christ. I said, what do you mean that the person in front of Christ? He said, well, we, we were talking in the fish and chip line. And I said, what are you doing? So I'm buying fish and chips. Why do you want fish and chips? Because I'm hungry. Why are you hungry? Well, because it's lunchtime. Uh, w- w- what's going to happen to the fish and chips? Well, I'm going to eat them. Um, what's that going to do for you? It's going to make me strong. Uh, why do you want to be strong? Because I want to live. Why do you want to live? Well, because I'm alive. Uh, how old are you? I'm 22. Okay, well, how long do you want to live for? Oh, I don't know, until I'm an old man. What's the point of your life anyway? I never thought about it. Well, you better think about it. Um, and what are you going to do next when you finish this life? Well, I've never thought about that either. Well, I think you should think about it, because actually, there's four people in front of us still. Let me tell you, you were born for a purpose. You were born, etc., etc. And he led the guy to Christ. Now, I, I was very cynical, and I sort of said to him, I, are you sure? He said, yes, he's going to come to the meeting tonight. We're having a week of meetings, you see. A team of students. And sure enough, he came that night. Well, I admire that. I would have just sat there thinking, why is this fish and chip line so long? I want my fish and chips, you know. (laughs) I never thought about the philosophy of buying fish and chips in order to feed your body to keep yourself alive. For what purpose? I don't know. (laughs) You see, what Jesus and what the New Testament says is not you're all evangelists. We're all involved in the process of witnessing through all kinds of means. We're running the Alpha course right now. I'll start again next week. And uh, if you've never been through it, I'd love for most of us to go through it and get involved in there. But you know, there are people who are involved in the Alpha course who spend time in a hot kitchen preparing a good meal. They're not evangelizing in the kitchen. They're just giving a nice meal to people who are going to be in an environment where they're going to listen to elements of the gospel, engage in discussion, and some of them in the mercy of God, are going to come to know Christ for themselves. Do you think the folks in the kitchen aren't part of that process? Of course they're part of that process. But actually, the problem when we say, I can't, is we make often a big mistake, and it's this. We divorce the responsibility given to the Christian from the resources given to the Christian. You see, the responsibility, as in Matthew 28, is go and make disciples of all nations. But don't take that out of its context, because in the context it says, Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, and that is the link word, what's going to follow only makes sense in light of what's gone before. All authority has been given to me, 
Therefore, you go, make disciples of all nations, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Listen, here's the responsibilities, right in the middle. Go and make disciples of all nations. Here are the resources. I am the one who has the authority, and I'm going to be in you and with you. Now, if you separate the res- responsibility from the resources, you'll say, oh, I've got to go into all the world. I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. But if you equate the responsibility with the resources, you realize, I am, as Paul said to uh, the Corinthians, we are workers together with God. Not for God, with God. You know, Paul said to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, about evangelizing Corinth. He said, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So he who plants and he who waters is not anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are workers together with God. So he says, one plants, one sows, one does the cooking in the kitchen on Alpha night. Others sit at the table talking. Somebody else might be up front doing some public speaking. We're all one team obtaining one purpose or going, working towards one purpose. There are young people here this morning. It's great that you're here this morning. And you may think, well, you know, this is what happens when you get to about 30. You start to think, what am I supposed to do as a Christian? No, it's what happens the day you become a Christian. And you may be 15 years old, 14 years old, 16 years old, 18 years old. God has things that you alone can do as he works through you. And there are all kinds of different things. We're not all going to be evangelists. Don't make that the criteria. How many souls do I lead to Christ? But how am I involved in working, praying, contributing to what is the ongoing mission of the church because this commission, as we're going to talk a bit later this, this fall, this commission, as we'll make clear later, is a corporate one, not a series of individuals. It's not, I have to take it into all the world, you have to take it into all the world and somebody else, but we corporately together as we'll see when we talk about the church as the body of Christ with different gifts and different responsibilities. But the resources is God himself at work in us and through us. So Luke records in Acts 1 verse 8, you receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you. That's the resources. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Don't take the middle of that sentence and say, oh, I want to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. You only understand the responsibility in the light of the resources. You receive power. So don't open your mouth until the Holy Spirit has been given to you. Stay right here. Because it's not what you will do for God. The exciting thing about Christian living is as we live in dependence and obedience and availability to God, He works through us. It doesn't mean we just become zombies, of course. We are actively involved in thinking, planning, talking, but... God is the one who gives the increase. One sows, another reaps, etc. So when we look at the responsibility, it's legitimate to say, I can't. But when you look at the resources, it is illegitimate to say, I can't. Because the truth is, I can't, but he can. And that, of course, is fundamental to Christian life. We can't do this task for him. We do this task in dependence on him. I can't. He can. Now, this is what was lacking, actually, in the church in Sardis, in that little bit that we read about it in Revelation chapter 3. He says in verse 1, one thing he says there is, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. Let me pause there. It's not the end of the sentence. Interesting statement, you have a reputation of being alive. What gave them a reputation for being alive? Well, I suggest to you they were probably very busy. They probably had lots of activity. There was lots of excitement. There was probably lots of razzmatazz. There were probably a big crowd of people. All the things that make people think, wow, that place is alive. You have a reputation for it. Why? Because there's stacks of programming and stacks of activity and stacks of noise. You're alive. But, he says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. What does it mean to be dead? Well, death is simply the absence of life. That's probably a definition of death. I don't know if it's a, if it's a scientific definition of death, but a doctor, 
attending to someone who may be dead doesn't look for death. He looks for life. And if he can't find life, you conclude by deduction. If there is no life, there is no pulse, there is no evidence of brain activity. If there is no life, there is death. Now said Jesus, this is the Lord Jesus diagnosing the church of Sardis. You are wrapped in being alive. You are full up with activities and noise and razzmatazz. But actually when I look for life, what is the, I don't find any. What is the life? The life, of course, is the life of God flowing in that church and through that church. You know, a church is not alive because it's big or because it's beautiful or because it's busy or because lots of people love to go there. A church is alive because the life of God flows in it. And people experience God. There are things going on that are inexplicable apart from the fact God is doing it. There are things you cannot explain in terms of personalities or in terms of gifts or in terms of programs. We try to put those explanations on things. It's the life of God. And here in the church in Sardis, he says, hey, you have a great reputation. Now, and people coming to Sardis say that's the church to go to because it's got a great reputation. A reputation of being alive, nonetheless. But the reality is you're dead. Why? Because you may have been taken the responsibility seriously, but you've divorced them from the resources. It's become a human operation. It's become an organization, well-managed, well-planned, well-functioning, rather than a living organism where the life of Christ is operating. How do you explain the church in the book of Acts? It was an exciting time, of course. Things that are new have an advantage. They tend to be not only fresh, but they tend to be true to uh, what their purpose is. But was the church in the Acts explicable because the disciples stuck out their chest at the end of the uh, when Jesus ascended and said hey listen we can do this come on let's go we'll do this do you know when you look at the three years the disciples spent with Jesus one of the things he was doing over those three years was increasingly exposing to them their weakness and their frailty that's why at the end, the climax, when Jesus is crucified, they've all run away. They've all hidden. Peter is utterly ashamed of himself. He has denied him and cursed and sworn about it. The others are behind locked doors. And when Jesus appeared, he rebuked them for their lack of belief. I mean, this is a bunch who have been reduced to a conclusion at the end of Jesus' three years with them. I am weak. And of course, that is the process we have to come to. That's why I wait in Jerusalem. It's not out of your strengths. We do have different strengths and gifts, but it's out of a sense of utter dependence because I know the bankruptcy of my own heart and my own life. And so when Paul, in the book of Acts, comes back from his missionary journeys, he, he reported back on several occasions. In Acts 14.27, after his first journey, he came to Antioch, which was the church that had sent him out. And it says, on arriving there, he, they, that is he and Barnabas, they gathered the church together and reported, listen, reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to Gentiles. Did they come back and report what they had been doing for God? No. They came back and reported all that God had done through them. Then they went down to Jerusalem, Acts 15, verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them who had done it. God had done it through them. Then there was a meeting in Jerusalem to discuss the reception of Gentiles. And it says at one point, Acts 15, 12, the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. God through them. Acts 21, 19, after his third missionary journey, Paul came to Jerusalem. He greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Do you notice the recurring message he's bringing back? I want to tell you what God has done through us. God through us. God through us. So much so in Romans 15, verse 18, Paul said, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. 
in leading Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done. Now, this is what makes the church alive. What makes the church alive is not its activities, it's not its programs, it's not its bigness or smallness, there's no virtue in either. What's made the church in the book of Acts alive is that it's God through them, God through them, God through them. And I have nothing to talk to you about, says Paul, except what Christ has done through me. Boy, that takes the pressure off, I tell you. If it's all about what we do for God, the pressure is on. If it's about what God does through us, we can rest in that spirit of obedience and dependence. It doesn't mean we become passive and sit back with our feet up, but we say, Lord, you're my life, you're my strength, you're the one who's going to work in me and through me. That's why we must understand the responsibility. Take the gospel to the world, beginning where we are, and we must understand the resources, the indwelling Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, who is sufficient and adequate for the task. That means the response, I can't do this, actually becomes invalid. Because, of course, you can't. But He lives in you. And He is the one on whom you place your dependence. And that means if we eliminate the I can't response, we have only two legitimate responses to this command. We either say, I will, or we say, I won't. Those are the only legitimate responses. Now, my friend Stuart Briscoe says, if you motivate people, you must also mobilize people, otherwise you frustrate them. Hmm. And that is very true. Although sometimes when you mobilize people, you motivate them because the mobilizing motivates them. Hmm. Getting involved gets you excited. But getting excited about getting involved will only frustrate. And we're talking not just about the program and activity of a individual church. We're talking about what must be bigger than that, a lifestyle that when you're in your workplace, in your home, you're saying, Lord, what is it you want to do in me and through me? Because here's the danger of a mature church, a chronologically mature church that's been around for many years, that we stop looking outward and we become very comfortable and it becomes almost a religious club that we become part of and we're just looking for our own needs. I've heard people say to me about this church, it doesn't meet my need. Well, I understand that because there are needs that we have personally. But our vision has to be something bigger than that. You know, there is, of course, ministry to the church itself. In Acts 2, when the church was born, in Acts 2.42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, those are four things that are, 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 are fundamental to an effective church. Coming under the teaching of the Word of God, which is described there as the Apostles' teaching. We have the Apostles' teaching in our New Testament Scriptures. So, the fellowship, the mutual building up of one another, the breaking of bread, participating in prayer. That could either be the Lord's Supper. It could be simply breaking bread as in fellowship, but probably it's the Lord's Supper. To prayer... And evangelism isn't specifically mentioned, but don't read that verse and take that as context without realizing that evangelism was the end result of this. Because it goes on to say that every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Here's the result. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the right and proper feeding of the people of God, the right and proper opportunities for the fellowship of the people of God, for the friendships of the people of God, for the sense of belonging, for the sense of, uh, of meeting together and being enriched by one another, sharpened their evangelism. It did not become a substitute for their evangelism. Because out of this flowed strength and a cutting edge. And I want to say to you that we on the pastoral staff of this church 
And those on the board of this church are looking together hard at this whole issue. How is it that we can be an effective evangelistic church? How can we be more effective as a missional church? Now, the word missional may be a new word to some of you. It's been around for a little while. But missional simply means that mission is why you exist. And mission is what you're doing. And becoming missional, the New Testament church was a missional church. It was driven by its mission. Its eyes were outward. And we have a wonderful advantage in this church because we have the heritage of this church being founded for the purpose of reaching citizens of this city with the gospel of Jesus Christ and then across the world through missionary outreach. And if we're not a missional church, if we're not on track with the Lord Jesus Christ, we may have a reputation of being alive. But like the church in Sardis, where it really matters, where the diagnosis really is important, we are dead. And that was the diagnosis of the Lord Jesus, of a church that looked alive. And over these next weeks, as we look together as to what exactly is the church in the New Testament? How is it designed to function? How is it supposed to be led? And what is leadership supposed to be doing? As we look at some of these things and try to extract from different parts of the New Testament what it teaches about this, our purpose and and prayer is not just that we get a nice, neat little doctrine of the church we can tuck away in the corner of our mind somewhere or stick onto a shelf somewhere. But the we as a body of hundreds and hundreds and, of course, thousands of people will actually be alive and not just have a reputation for being alive. Alive with the life of God flowing through us to the benefit and blessing of other people. And the folks whose opinion is probably the most valid about this church, not the folks, those of us sitting here this morning, it's the folks who live 100 meters away. If you were to knock on their door. You know, the people's church, yes. What do you think about them? Well, they park in the wrong places every Sunday. Well, apart from that, get over that. What else do you think about them? I don't know anything else about them. That is a real indictment. And if somehow this church disappeared next week, I wonder if Toronto Star would even notice it. And put a little footnote. Hey, the People's Church, Shepherd, disappeared last week. Anybody know which church I'm talking about? (laughs) And that's all of us together because the body, which is the church is described as, as my human body, and we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks' time, doesn't have an independent toe plan, toe vision. My toes don't have visions. (laughs) My toe is connected to the head. And if I need to kick a ball, that's my head's business. The toe simply gets on with it. And we're talking about a corporate sense, a belonging, a unison. We're all individuals, of course, within the body but corporately together. What Oswald Smith envisioned 80 years ago, and this would be a place where the unchurched of this city, the unbelievers of this city, might know that Jesus Christ is alive. As he wrote, we're reaching out for the thousands of people who never enter a church door. Trouble is, when lots of people come to the church door, we're so busy looking after them, we forget about the folks who never cross the door. And that's what we have to recapture. We have to recapture. Otherwise, we become a sadist church. Reputation may be, but dead. The danger of a mature church. Thank you for joining Charles Price on Living Truth. 
Join us next week when Charles Price teaches about the church as a body of Christ.